Okay, cool. Well, hello. Oh. This is the 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 panel of uh, 2021's brutally honest review of the Sega Dreamcast. I am Dreamcast Guy. Obviously, it's printed on my hat. And this is my good buddy, MVG, Modern Vintage Gamer. Hey, what's on, everyone? Thanks for, uh, Max, thanks for um, taking the time out to hang out. It's going to be fun. I'm going to talk the Dreamcast, man. One yeah. of my favorite game consoles. I know, obviously, yeah. your favorite game console. So part of the reason I wanted to grab uh, MVG for this is that uh, both of us are very, very long-term fans of the Dreamcast. Both of us got it pretty close to launch. Both of us have actually experienced both sides of it as well, which is when the games were coming out and the homebrew scene afterwards. So part of what I want to talk about today is let's actually break down why it's really interesting that the Dreamcast now feels different than it did back in the day i feel like i almost feel like it's lived on more in this fan age than it even did when sega supported it so um yeah. i mean let, let's just start off with some of the thoughts uh i i love pretty much everything about the dreamcast to say a criticism though there is stuff that was invented by the dreamcast that is kind of funny like did you know that uh, the dreamcast invented day one dlc there were dreamcast games that had something on the disc and you had to connect yeah. the Sega net to unlock them. Those, those yeah, were which which is kind of cool. I mean, in many ways, you know, there's that connection with the Xbox, right? Because you know how Microsoft was, you know, was working on um, the original batch of Sega games cause, uh -huh. and, and Microsoft wanted to um, get, get Sega games on their Xbox and all that stuff. So in, in many ways, the Xbox kind of took a lot of the um the features and some of the initiatives that the dreamcast had and kind of ran with them right because like you know sega net came out before xbox live right and that yeah. was probably really the i mean sure there was like um the sega channel and, and and things on the satin and stuff but it was really i guess the first you know online environment that many people experienced it was definitely mm -hmm. my first yeah, one same. i probably yours right yeah i had my dial up modem and and i would dial up to pso and and all yes, that yes use, use the web browser and and have a lot of fun um and with that yeah you could download um patches dlcs and there was there was ones that came on memory cards like you said um there was also um the um like the the save games as well you could download save games and install a monty memory card online so yeah it, in many ways it was um yeah man it revolutionized a lot of the i guess the the things that we take for granted in in games these days like you know dlc patches mm -hmm. and um online connectivity and and save files and all that stuff and it's yeah, it's it's just a great system to think about. I, I still remember the first time I saw the the big old famous two sp uh, two page spread for Fantasy Star Online, and it showed a bunch of players and they're fighting the the dragon first boss of Fantasy Star Online, and each of them was speaking a different language in their text bubble, and it said yeah. "connect to the internet," and I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> is that possible?" Uh, but it's kind of crazy to me thinking back how well it worked. Like it's kind of insane when you realize that this stuff was just like. It, just this little tiny box that was Windows CE, mm -hmm. so basic on the surface, but man, did it work. It, it's yeah. it, it was one of the first times where I saw something that was so advanced because I, I feel like a lot of people sort of forget this now, but that came out, the Nintendo 64 was still on shelves. You know, oh, like, yeah. the, like yeah. the Nintendo 64 was still selling games and all of a sudden this thing comes out that's four-player couch co-op and online and all these arcade games that were technically impossible before that. Here's Crazy Taxi and Marvel's Capcom 2. Everything ported, picture perfect. It it completely blew me away so much just right... Or as soon as I saw the Dreamcast, I was like, this is it. This is who I am. Well, I think, you know, Sega um, at the time, even with, like, the Saturn, right? Like, they their, their home console hardware was almost you know um one-to-one -one of the arcade hardware at the mm -hmm. time so the saturn was um in the arcades was the sega stv hard and the games were pretty much the same and the same thing happened with dreamcast with the naomi um arcade hardware so um that was one of the really cool things that the dreamcast really brought to to home console gaming before that because that that concept of 
an arcade perfect game mm -hmm. didn't really exist before the dreamcast right i mean mm -hmm. sure there were some games that that like you know on the genesis maybe that that were pretty close to yeah arcade close perfect. or or like to, to teenage mutant ninja turtles games that yeah. were like 90 percent there but but the dreamcast was literally the same hardware as mm -hmm. the arcade hardware other than just less ram and a dvd or a gd rom drive right so you were literally getting the arcade experience in in the in the home and for me, that was one of the big motivators to get the Dreamcast because you knew, like, if you if you picked up Soul Calibur or if you picked up House of the Dead Two, yes, yeah, I was gonna say the gun you games. Were getting, you were getting the arcade experience. Like, this was not a uh, it's a port or um you know it's it's you know um it doesn't run as well or something. It was literally running the same at the same level of performance. And Soul Calibur, as we know is an even better conversion or it's an even better game than the arcade one ever was so that was a, a real huge draw card for me that you were this was the first system where you know every game system would advertise bringing the arcade yep. to your living room but this was the actual system that that finally had done it and man i was was i there for it? i i loved it. i loved it when when that came out because every game you knew that you were getting not every game but most of the games you picked up especially if they came from the arcades were going to be quality you know all the way mm -hmm. and it's funny uh years ago i was writing a video about uh atari and the end of the atari 2600 7200 era and one of the things that sort of killed them the most was that arcade war was that arcades were this untapped powerhouse every game developer pretty much built their own machine they could make it as mm. strong or as weak as they needed and stuff and I feel like the Dreamcast really managed to tap into that and went, all right, we're going to make the machine that's powerful enough to play everything you want instantaneously from Jet Grind Radio to Shinmu. We can put those graphics that seemed impossible and make yeah. it seem so easy. And it's mm -hmm. interesting how after launch, one of the things that's been blowing me the way the most is, is the people that managed to tap in there and wire in the HDMI mods and stuff that look 60 frames a second, 1080p, it's insane how much that thing upscales. For something that came out 20 years ago, a, a lot of those games look very, very modern. Like, yeah. it, it still trips me out. The snow effects in Shinmu are so lifelike. It's crazy that they made that decades ago. Yeah, I mean, it was really the dawn of um, 3D as, as we know it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, 3D existed before the Dreamcast, but a lot of those effects and, and, and the, the graphics, you know, that was the graphics hardware that was in the Dreamcast was I mean, it was very very powerful especially for a home system and you're right i mean it's still some of these games still look incredible you know like you, you just have to sit there and just appreciate like in in some cases you're seeing them for the first time in a way that you never really saw them in the past because you were running them on a crt which hey i love crts don't get me wrong but mm -hmm. now you have this clarity of like you said an, an upscale 1080p um resolution it just looks, you know, some of these games look just incredible. And, you know, I always go back to like Soul Calibur because, man, that, that game just looks so good. Um, mm -hmm. Even even with, you know, on, on an HDMI uh, modded Dreamcast. And some of the games, you know, maybe will show some imperfections and some, you know, that they look a little rough around the edges. And I guess it was something that the CRT was good at hiding, you know, some bad textures and stuff. But... Mm -hmm. Um, but overall, man, yeah, it's it's the, the system has in, aged incredibly well. I think probably probably the best system that has aged well. Um, you know, when I think about you know previous game systems I, for me, I've thought about that too. There was a it was a debate on the internet last year, uh, and people were talking about the consoles that aged the best. And I saw people talking about uh, how sprites age incredibly well. The eight and sixteen bit eras. Like yeah. your your imagination carries so much already, but I've always said Dreamcast because Dreamcast doesn't require much of your imagination. Like the the wispy hair and stuff in Soul Calibur still looks right. decent. Like it's a maybe they look like they need a haircut a little bit, but they <laughs> they certainly look pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I mean, still think that the the one thing I feel like killed Dreamcast in my opinion is I feel like they did the power right, they did the controller. I mean the controller is a little bit funky, but I kind of grew to love it. The major thing I think is man, do they need a DVD drive. Now, you know yeah. more about programming. Would that yeah. have really helped? Because it seemed to me that the games had a, had a, a size limit that they hit really quick. Like, whereas when the DVD games came out, like Final Fantasy X is so massive, one DVD disc. If Final Fantasy X was a Dreamcast, it'd be like seven discs, you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the, the competition, right, the PS2 and the Xbox, um, 
both of them had DVDs in them, you know, and uh, Sony, from what I understand, um, Ken Kutaragi, the, you know, the, the inventor of the, the PlayStation and the PS2, mm -hmm. he wanted, he, he basically demanded that that's Sony put a DVD player in the PS2. Mm. The PS2 initially, from what I understand, never had a DVD player as part of its plans, but he said, we have to put a DVD player in the system. Um, we need we need people a to have access to large storage so we can put you know bigger games mm -hmm. on the on on there, but also let them watch DVDs when they don't want to play video games, right? So you've got this all in one you know media device now, right? And I think that's ultimately what it's one reason why the PlayStation Two was so successful. It wasn't mm -hmm. the reason for it, but I, I agree with you. I think. The Dreamcast really could have benefited from, you know, from a DVD player inside of it as well. Um, I definitely think it would have added another dimension to not only the games, because like you said, the GD-ROM format was a little weird. You know, you only had like one gigabyte of storage and mm -hmm. like you had games like Shenmue that was it like four discs or it's something? Four, it was, four discs. Yeah. yeah. That's such a I mean, <laughs> You know, that, that game, I mean, that game is incredible, but. Um, the amount of CD swapping that you were doing and and all that stuff it got a little tedious, especially you know when you were you know traveling around. But I think ultimately, um, because there was no way to store these games, like there was no hard drive, um, at least initially, right, um, meant that you couldn't just install these games onto onto a hard drive mm -hmm. and play them there. So you were kind of really kind of limited to you know the GD ROM. Um, that was that was the only thing you had. So yeah, I, I do think that there is some truth to, to that, that maybe they should have put a DVD player in there and, you know, the games would have, would have been, you know, would have fit on one C on one DVD, right. Or maybe two mm -hmm. max. Um, so it would have definitely helped, I think with, you know, with the distribution and everything. And maybe some backwards compatibility, which I, I realize is much harder. Uh, I, I don't know anything about programming or architecture, but I've always heard people who are much smarter than myself talk about how impossibly difficult the Sega Saturn was. Like, stuff inside there was just gobbledygook gears. So I know that it's kind of impossible, but if they had somehow yeah. managed to make it where you could pop a Sega Saturn disc, that was definitely the major seller of the PS2, I feel like, is, hey, it's the PS1 machine, but with DVDs! <laughs> yeah. Well, we got Blame, though, right? Like, we you, did get Blame. You played around with Blame. That was pretty impressive. Um, that that stuff as well. I, I have all three of the Blame games. Uh, for those who don't know, there was a very short-lived company called Blame that released what what was going to be a long-running project. They were going to be taking games from the PlayStation One, making HD textures and putting them on the Dreamcast one at a time. They ended up doing mm -hmm. Tekken Three. Looks great. Gran Turismo looks freaking great. And the other one was Metal Gear Solid. I have them all. They're really really good. Uh, and then they got sued into the ground by sega of course or was it they got sued by sega or sony sony, sony yeah. yeah sony sued them um i even have the that prototype disc that was floating around on the internet about 20 years ago which is uh the unfinished version of bleem that runs a couple extra games you could put in mm -hmm. any playstation game pretty much anything with cutscenes wouldn't work but if you could put in stuff that didn't have a lot of cutscenes, it, it would actually work so yeah yeah that, uh, that was a lot of fun that that bleem um i think it was bleem cast they, they called it right mm -hmm. um I only had one of the discs, but it was, um, I think it was Gran Turismo. And uh, man, that was pretty incredible technology because, you know, thinking that a Dreamcast can emulate a PS1 was not something that you could even wrap your head around because, I mean, in many ways, um, it wasn't like a PS1 wasn't that far away from a Dreamcast in terms of power. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the Dreamcast could pretty much just own the PS1 and run the games, but not only run them, upscale them to 640 by 480 and and, sm and add smoothing and mm -hmm. add better textures like you said it was just incredible oh it's so good um that was kind of what kind of uh got me the most into the dreamcast is uh i got my dreamcast back in high school uh shortly after it came out i got it in like 2000 uh mid 2000 so when games were still being released uh and they dried up real quick so it kind of went into my closet but uh in the high school era uh, late high school is when the emulators started popping up where people yep. would have a disc and somebody gave me a disc that just said every Super Nintendo game and I had a guy flexing on it for some reason and I'd pop in that disc and I could play <laughs> at Chrono Trigger. I played Chrono Trigger for the first time ever on my Dreamcast and the sound, the, the frame rate was a little bit weird. If the sound mm -hmm. was on, but you could turn the sound off and it worked perfect. And it was crazy. Yeah. That was the first time where I ever saw emulation of another console on a console that just tripped me out that that was even possible 
yeah the um that was probably my first experience with like the the homebrew scenes right mm -hmm. was on was on the dreamcast there was I, n I never was involved personally like i didn't do anything in those scenes but i was definitely following what was going on because i was very into it too like yeah you said you know you could run super nintendo games on the dreamcast and um they were making all sorts of things run on the dreamcast like mm -hmm. nes super nes playstation um i remember neo geo games would run on the dreamcast as well mm -hmm. it was it was um an amazing amazing community and from what i know like and we've seen this like they're still making games for this like mm -hmm. today like there's there's homebrew developers out there making games for the dreamcast in some cases they're being sold so they can make some money mm -hmm. from those sales as well which is awesome but um yeah for me that was my first taste of of that community the the homebrew community and man i was into it i i remember playing that super nes emulator as well and you're right it wasn't perfect but on the flip side it's like this is incredible yeah like, Incredible that this is happening right now you know and well, it, it was definitely one of my motivators for getting into the homebrew scenes after the dreamcast mm -hmm. like the original xbox came out and 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 places like that but um man i loved it i loved every minute of it it, it just tripped me out because it, it could play every game like it, it was so interesting to me that you could just so easily uh it, you could actually there was somebody taught me how you could put in the the emulator and the emulator would just like sit in the code you could pop out the disc and put in a disc of rom so you could have yep. like every single super nintendo game and they all worked which is kind of a testament to the fact that it was interesting that the Dreamcast ran on Windows CE. So pretty much anything you could make run on Windows would run on this. So a lot mm -hmm. of people were putting a lot of stuff on there. There used to be this community of people who would create like facsimile tech demo things on Dreamcast for fun. Like one of the ones yeah. I saw was a uh, Halo Dreamcast. They basically modded a very downgraded version of Counter-Strike and very poorly modded in the guns from Halo and then poured it to Dreamcast. So you could play yeah. it and there couldn't be bots. You couldn't play online, but it was Halo on a Dreamcast. I don't yeah, know. Maybe. I really appreciate that stuff. Oh, definitely. I mean, the the amount of creativity that, that I saw was, was just some of the best that I've ever seen. Um, and like I said, it, it was definitely a motivator for me to, to get, get involved in those scenes and, and learn, you know, programming and, and, and cause I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to do that stuff too. And, um, I think it all, I think, I mean, sure. was, were there homebrew scenes before the Dreamcast? Yeah, there was like on the, on the PS2, mm -hmm. you know, you could run super NES emulators and stuff like that too. But, um, for me, it was the Dreamcast that really kickstarted that, that whole scene, you know, um, by, by, by far. Uh, it was such a good console, but I, I do feel like it, it was held back by, I, I feel like the marketing was very all over the place. Uh, that That's something I feel like kind of killed it the most was the lack of a DVD player. And yep. some of those old ads didn't explain what the system was, where it's like a bunch of video game characters standing in a mall line joking around. Like, while those are funny and iconic to us now because we understand what it is, I feel like they just did such a bad job of like, Super Nintendo and Nintendo games have some of the most memorable commercials because it was just like, here's a, a guy dressed as Link. Hey, buy my game. And he stabs Ganon. You're like, okay, yeah. I know what that product's going to be. Ninten like Sega was so weird and random with the Dreamcast commercials. Like it's thinking and it just had a swirl. Like, yeah, I don't know. It, <laughs> it, it, it's so bad. And I can't remember a single Dreamcast game commercial. I never saw a Jet Grind radio ad or an ad for, hey, here's here's a i don't know tokyo extreme racer it's weird right. that they didn't advertise it harder i think maybe i remember like soul caliber or something um maybe house of the dead um mm. was was something i recall but you're right it, it was it was it was you know sega was in a weird place at the time right like they they didn't really know how to market the system very well um and i lived in australia at the time and i, I can tell you um we got not we got hardly anything as far as exposure for the Dreamcast down mm -hmm. there. I was buying, I think it was um, in the UK they had the official um, uh, Sega Dreamcast magazine. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would actually buy to find out what the latest games that were coming out were, because uh, I had no idea what was coming next from from North America and Japan. So I would have to resort to like magazines to to find out you know what was coming. Um, there was no commercials. Um, at least not none that I really recall very well that 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 were kind of advertising the Dreamcast, but 
man, there were there tons of PS2 commercials mm-hmm. and and even the Xbox, right? Had Halo and and um, games like that 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 were coming out, Fable and, and you know some of the early mm-hmm. original Xbox games that were, were that were coming out. Um, but yeah, I don't really recall much. Even stuff like SegaNet, right? Um, which mm-hmm. was available in Australia, which I, I used to to connect up to like PSO and stuff. That wasn't really very well advertised either. It was it was something that I just kind of realized was was an option for the Dreamcast. And but yeah, the marketing around the Dreamcast certainly didn't help. Um, and you could tell that maybe you know budgets were shrinking a lot at the time. Yeah, they weren't really sure what what the next move would be. Um, and as we know, it it, it didn't work out for them. But um, I yeah. I have um, all the the European Dreamcast magazines, which I think are the ones that they sold in uh, in Australia yep. as well. They, there's six, they did, yeah. there's sixteen of them. I own all sixteen issues. I own all yep. the the American Dreamcast magazine as well, uh, and that had uh, the demo discs. So I have all yeah. the demo discs for them. And y'all's had Man. y'all's had much better art than ours had. Ours yeah. were like <laughs> ours were like straight orange. Y'all had pictures and characters on them. Yeah, I, I miss those demo discs. That that was so much fun, man. Mm-hmm. Like the fact that you could just get a disc full of demos Uh um, was just so cool. Like right now you think about it in today's world and today's landscape, you're like, what are you talking about? But like, man, it was, it was so much fun to get those demo discs and just play through all the games and then kind of make a decision on which games that you wanted to buy, Uh you know, based on that, it was, it was really, really helpful back then. You know, I mean, the internet was definitely around, don't get Uh me wrong, but it was it was not as as fast and information was being sent to you like it is on social media these days on twitter and stuff like that i mean mm-hmm. you know stories took days to break out you know to break and um the only website that was really around at the time was that was making news was like ign you know but they yeah. were they weren't really doing kind of breaking news stuff but they were just kind of doing reviews of dreamcast games that had, had released right so mm-hmm. um yeah, getting your information was was a lot more difficult, especially you know not living in North America at the time made it made it very tricky. Oh That's yeah, I'm time. sure. The uh, because we're, I was in a much more low income area, what we do is uh, demo discs were very much this like social celebration. What we do is people would get demo discs. I'll, I'll be honest, people shoplifted them a lot, and so we <laughs> like steal a demo disc and bring it back, and everybody would play through all the demos together like ten times, and then vote yeah. on the game we were gonna buy. Um, and a lot of times they'd make us buy games that we typically wouldn't have because you're like, okay, mm-hmm. what the hell is this? Like, I remember the the Tomba demo on PS1. That was one we bought, or Phantom Dust. I don't know, just a lot of that stuff. And, and Dreamcast had so many different demos where it was just yeah. like, oh, okay, now here, I, I wouldn't have thought Jet Grind Radio sounds like three random words, but you play that yeah. Jet Grind Radio demo, you're like, yep, I'm sold. I'm definitely buying that. <laughs> oh yeah, dude, dude, that was that's definitely. I mean, you know, that was that was one of the most incredible incredible games that that had ever come out for the system um and one of the most influential memorable games that i I can even think of you know like that and you you can appreciate this but that feeling that you got the first time you 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 put that game in Uh like i don't think i can ever you know recapture that moment like there was one of those games for me that was just like this game is like crazy but it's incredible and i love everything about it like everything about it um it's the, almost the perfect game for me, honestly. The animation, the thing that sticks in my mind is the first time you pull the trigger to skate fast and there's those yeah. little like cell shaded cartoon fire lines that come off your skates. That was yeah. so crazy. That game actually, uh, my friend group became so obsessed with it. Uh, what we did is how all the characters, when you weren't moving, they'd slowly start dancing to the music. <laughs> we right. did yeah, that yeah. to each other. So what we would do is if you were telling a story to one of your buddies or something, you'd be like, and you'd start doing the, like, <laughs> because that was like, uh, that was my favorite thing about that universe is it felt like there yeah. was this, this vibe. It was like this whole thing of like, Oh, there's like an energy, like it's dance town, baby. got to do your yeah. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. that's kind of the vibe of the Dreamcast. I think that's part of the reason that people are still loving it so much today is that every game had such a passion about it. Like every game from the famous plane shooter games like Aerial Wings or yep. even Armada, like every game on there. Like I mentioned earlier, Tokyo Extreme Racer is mm. a freaking top notch racer. That simulation, uh, it's got really good physics. The yeah. fact that you, it's a game where you race on a big, huge highway network, basically, and you can flash your lights at any other racer, yeah. and yeah, it just yeah, yeah. becomes the track. Instant taste. It's like an adaptive race roguelike, almost. <laughs> so incredible. Oh, man. Yeah. I, the racing games on the Dreamcast were just... They, 
I remember being spoiled with racing games because there were so many great ones. Uh-huh. Tokyo Extreme Racer was definitely um, one of the better ones, but I also like Metropolis Street Racer, you know, the game uh-huh. by Bizarre Creations that came out before Project Gotham on the on the Xbox. Uh-huh. Like, that game was just top tier for me. Um, you know, they had implemented the Kudos system, and you could tell that, that these guys knew what they were doing, but there was also, like, um, Ferrari F... Three three five five, mm-hmm. um, Daytona, which which wasn't bad. Like I mean, I, I I like Daytona on the Dreamcast. It looks it looks incredible. I wish you know the controls were a yeah, little better. But good. <laughs> Tokyo Tokyo Racer. Um, uh, oh, what, what, what's uh, the te- was test what's drive? The, what's the future one? Future is uh, San Francisco twenty forty nine or whatever. Where you oh, have like the yeah. remote control the, cars that would spin the <laughs> San Francisco Rush. Oh, dude, yes, that, that, that that version was incredible. It was I had so on, good. On, I had it on the N64 and it was good, but the Dreamcast version was was just oh man, it was an, it was like two levels above the the N64 version. The, the was, draw distance because when you're on those big ramps and in these big beautiful cities, I, I think the frame rate and gameplay and controls were pretty much identical yeah. between them. But that draw distance of the Dreamcast, the fact that you could like hit a ramp and gawk at where you were flying in the middle of flying yeah. there, oh my god, it it really was the technical prowess of the Dreamcast for sure. Absolutely. And then of course, um, you know, the Tony Hawk games, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, Tony Hawk two was was the first like I played Tony Hawk two on the Dreamcast first before the PlayStation and uh, absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. I mean, a- another game that just like the Dreamcast couldn't like everything was a hit for me. Like every single game that I that I picked up for it was was a ten out of ten. Like it, this system could not do anything wrong. There was there wasn't a bad game for me. And Tony Hawk was just another one of those games that was just like, this is incredible. I've never experienced a game like this before. And, you know, it's it's been obviously gone down in history as one of the greats, you know. It's so good. I ended up, uh, I love that book, or I love that game so much. I ended up buying a Tony Hawk's book. It's an autobiography of his life leading up to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. And in the yeah. epilogue, he talks about how popular that game was. And he said that he'd be like at a Burger King and a kid would literally pull out a copy of like Tony Hawk on Dreamcast. I'm like, could you sign this? And he's like, why do you have that? Why is that in your butt? And he's like, that's when he realized like, oh, okay, this game is like the best game ever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it, it's just just amazing, amazing memories, and and uh, like I said, um, the games are just incredible. And then, you know, the Resident Evil series, uh, the oh. Code Veronica, that was that was another game that it came out on the Dreamcast first, if you remember, and I think it was exclusive for actually quite a while before yeah. it came to the PS2. I want to say, um, I loved every minute of that game when it came out. I mean, it, it's it has a, has it aged particularly well. I don't know if it has, but at the time, because um, remember before that, it was Resident Evil was you know the the fixed camera um, mm-hmm. with the the, the hand drawn backgrounds, right? And all of a sudden, this game it's fixed camera, but it's all fully three D and everything, and um, it just took advantage of the Dreamcast's the Dreamcast's features and um, great game. You know, it- I, I really really enjoyed it. I truly believe, and I say this as a massive fan of Resident Evil, the the Dreamcast versions are the best of them. Uh, and, oh, I, and I don't just mean, yeah. like, the resolution is good, but additionally, it, it had a feature that never existed on any other console, which is that on the Dreamcast controller, of course, we had the VMU, the visual memory unit. You had a screen on your controller, and they would use that to display your current health and your ammunition yep. sometimes. So it was nice because in those old games, since there wasn't any on-screen information by design... Um, yeah. It was nice to be able to just physically look down your controller and go, okay, I got three bullets left till I got to reload. That was yeah. so cool. Oh, I love Dude, that. Dude, the, the VMU was, was oh, man, I, you're getting me excited now because my my best game that took advantage of the VMU, did you ever play Silent Scope? By yes, Konami? I did, yes. Do you yeah. remember how it would, you know, the VMU would, would basically show you in the VMU if mm-hmm. you'd lined up the shot, right? Mm-hmm. They do a little Man, flashing that, reticle zooming. That looks thing. so yeah. cool. I I love that stuff. Like the the amount of creativity that went into making these games, and the fact that they took advantage. Not every game took advantage of the VMU. I mean, a lot of them didn't really do anything, right? But mm-hmm. some of them really use utilize the VMU in some really interesting ways. Um, Silent Scope for me was definitely one of them, but man, there were so many fun, fun memories of, of the VMU in some of those games. I'll never forget the, just the Silent Scope. It was during that era where your, your title screen had to shout its title. And I always remember the way it goes. Silent Scope. Yeah, yeah. Silent Scope. <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> 
Um, I remember, I think there's there's 12 VMU games total officially that were ever released. Um, and I always think about the Skies of Arcadia one. What you do is mm. when you saved your Skies of Arcadia file, you could be like, oh, I want to make a VMU file game. And it'd take up pretty much your entire freaking memory card, but it made it where while you were at school and you got a little tiny thing on there because it's got buttons and a joypad, um, yeah. you could do a game where you'd actually have your little pilot fly through a little gauntlet and it'd give you like 100 in-game bucks. And so you'd play like 20 times on lunch. You could p- plug back in and, hey, look, now you're ready uh, to buy the next weapon. And yeah, it doesn't <laughs> matter that much. And you yeah, in the age of mobile games, that thing would never work. Kids are playing Fortnite on their phones now. But man, yeah. in 1999, that was like future tech. Like, oh, here's a baby Game Boy. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Do you think, um, I mean, I know, you know, we talked about the, the, the DVD player, which is, is a big omission. But do you think there was there, there was anything else that maybe would have saved the Dreamcast from its you know, ultimate demise in the end. The lack of RPGs. Uh, I'm super obsessed with RPGs. And, and I think that uh, the only thing that tainted my, my early love of Dreamcast is I came from PlayStation 1 to Dreamcast. So already having yeah. played Final Fantasy 7, 8, and 9, playing games like Legend of Dragoon, playing all these games that had leveling systems and hundreds yep. of hours and crazy cutscenes. And then you go to the Dreamcast, which has almost no turn-based RPGs at all, other than like mm-hmm. Evolution, which let's face right. it sucks. And that hurt it so bad because it made yeah. it where I, I saw it as uh, we're complimenting the arcade feel of it. But at times it also felt like, oh, that's the games I don't even need a memory card for, which that's yeah. not exactly what you want it to have as marketing. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, obviously, you know, Grandia uh, 2 uh-huh. and Skies of Arcadia are, you know, are masterpieces now. If you think about it, really, really good games. But yeah, I square you know they weren't even they weren't even involved in the dreamcast and and it would have been really nice to have seen some really good turn-based rpgs on the system which yeah for whatever reason i don't know why maybe sega didn't really go after those companies and try to get those games on the dreamcast but i i do think it would have it would have really just rounded out the collection a lot better if if they were available the the rumor I've heard, and I don't know exactly where it came from, but it's that the uh, the president of Nintendo of America at the time uh, in some big meeting when they were kind of lining up what the first years of projects were going to be, uh, apparently he had a quote where he said, uh, Americans don't like slow RPGs. Mm-hmm. I don't know why he said this. He's definitely an older dude. Maybe he just kind of didn't understand the market, but it's very baffling that he said that. And so because of it, a lot of people just, a lot of projects didn't get green light because there are yeah. RPGs over in Japan that just were never translated. <laughs> like yeah. the games existed. They could have brought them over and there was like, eh, you, you, don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, definitely um, they, the focus was on the arcade games, which I mean, they had, they had that whole, whole thing stitched up, but it would have been, Definitely would have been nice to even even like you know turn based strategy games and things mm-hmm. like that um, would have been really cool to have seen on, on the Dreamcast. But um, hey, you know, unfortunately we can't change history. You know, um, but the the technical advancements goes. of that console again and again while I was playing through it because I've played uh, every North American Dreamcast game ever released. I've played them all. I've actually beaten most of them. Um, there are a lot of just random games that are so extremely high quality, so innovative, and are just completely lost to history because the console unfortunately failed so bad. One of them was this one called Combat Zone. It was a mm-hmm. real-time strategy game, uh, and one of the interesting mechanics about it is that the way you would get funding because you're a military organization is propaganda. So you'd actually have a film crew follow your army around so you'd go into battle and you'd film yourself winning and this little tiny tv would have a little cg really crappy yeah. thing of like them showing it on like fake fox news and stuff and people are like yay and it'll say like <laughs> approval rating gone up and then the government will green light you getting more money so innovative so freaking yeah. ahead of its time no nobody would ever even try that again and it was so good it controlled so well the graphics are so good but yeah. man i feel like I, I guess part of what's sad to me is i bet a lot of studios bet on the dreamcast and probably went under like a lot of projects they put every single drop of their love into it and then because yeah i mean a lot of exclusives right that didn't come out on other systems and Mm -hmm. you're right i mean and yeah they probably bet the house on on the dreamcast version and yeah unfortunately sales wouldn't have gone very well for them which is which is unfortunate but you know a lot of the games did come out multi-platform as well so hopefully Mm -hmm. they were able to recoup you know the cost on on the playstation 2 which obviously was the very most successful system at the time. Mm-hmm. So, 
I think that that uh, in hindsight, we can now realize that the thing that probably killed the Dreamcast more than anything else was the absolute ease of piracy. Um, the oh, fact yeah. that oh, no, yeah. nobody yeah. could sell a game on that because one copy would sell, everybody copied it. Once you realize you could just burn games, you didn't have to unscrew the console, you didn't have to do anything. You just popped it in there, you'd Google the game and self-boot, there was the entire yeah. game. And it made it where... Once people figure that out, you could see a, that it, it just became a death sentence. Nobody uh, is going to put anything on that console ever again. And it just torpedoed no doubt. it. I remember when, when all that came out, um, Max, I um, I think it was the Utopia boot disc, uh -huh. if, if that rings a bell. I downloaded it and I burnt it. And I was like, this can't be real. This, this, this is too easy. Uh -huh. Like, there's, there's something... Uh, you know, we're being trolled here, right? That uh -huh. this, is, this is real. This is fake. Because, like... Back in those days, um, there was all these like fake N64 emulators and and fake. Oh, really? And fake. They I ended up being that. viruses, right? So <laughs> I, I downloaded I downloaded this this Utopia boot disk and I burnt it. And I was like, I was like kind of worried to put it in my Dreamcast because I didn't know what, what it was going to do. Maybe uh -huh. it would like screw up the the firmware it just or something and, it. and brick the system. You yeah. know? Um, but I I I remember powering it up and it said insert you know backup disc i'm like uh -huh. oh my god so then i made like I, I found a copy of i don't remember what game it was um one of the smaller ones and i made a copy of it and it booted i was like uh -huh. this is this is incredible but it's also really really scary if you're sega right now because their entire library can now literally be you know backed up and and leaked onto the internet and that's exactly what happened i think know, unfortunately my utopia boot disc uh it had a picture of a reindeer when you turned it on did you have that yeah, one that's the one that's the yep. that's the utopia boot disc and it would yeah. have it has a picture of like a cg floating reindeer yep. and you put the disc in and it puts this coat on him of the disc so you put it like <laughs> marvelous capcom and he's just the marvelous yep. capcom reindeer what the hell? That was the most random, bizarre. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of good memories of that thing. And then um, I think they figured out after the boot disc that they you didn't even need the boot disc, right? You could, yep. they, like they, they figured out how to just make the games boot self boot without yep, the boot disc. And that was, an, dude. I remember when Shenmue um, came out because that leaked onto the internet, and um, somehow, and I don't know how they did this because it was on four discs, right? Yeah, um, like four GD ROMs. Mm -hmm. And remember, GD-ROMs are at one gigabyte in size, right? And the and, and at, well, the the CDs that you would buy and, and copy were only six hundred meg. Yep. Um, so somehow they like managed to compress all the video down and fit this game onto four CDs, not four not four GD-ROMs, but like four burnt CDs. Mm -hmm. And I remember playing the game, thinking, "How have they done this? Like, how have they managed to squeeze this game onto four CDs?" and they basically compressed in all the videos and they like reduced the the audio quality which which is hilarious because the audio quality the speech quality on Shenmue yep. itself isn't particularly great anyway yeah I um, see. and they managed just to oh. like get this game down to four discs and then they like spread it on the internet and said here's Shenmue you know download it and i remember playing through it and i was like this is amazing like i can't believe this um i ended up getting a copy of it uh, I, own, I own both one and two now mm -hmm. um because i wanted the originals because i love playing the games but it was you're right it was man it was open season like oh yeah. there was, instantly there was nothing, it there was took nothing over the whole internet do. and you know this was way back before the days of like the dmca takedowns and mm -hmm. and stuff like that i mean sega was trying to shut down websites but um i mean it was everywhere you know if yeah. you wanted something you could get it to, to put it in context for chat, basically this was, this was, it was so easy. Imagine if a website popped up, because a lot of times they'd be called, the website would be called something like freedreamcast.com yeah. or something. And you imagine if there's a website that popped up today that was called free PS4 games and you could just click a button because it would just be an alphabetical list of every Dreamcast game and you just click it. Put it on a disc, put it in your Dreamcast instantaneously worked. I mean, it would destroy Sony and, and that's yeah. what it was such it was a wildfire. I do remember mm -hmm. that one of the only games that didn't work because it was just such a big, it was like the entire size of a GD ROM was a uh, silver. Silver could not be burned. I heard. Mm -hmm. and, and that was one of those ones where it just had so much goofy audio and so many particle yeah. effects and fire effects. There was like, Nope, it's, it, it's GD ROM only. There were some games that, that didn't translate very well, that they couldn't rip very well. Um, and they, they would like cut out, you know, like, um, some video files and stuff mm -hmm. um but 
like most of the games did did come out and dude i remember i i don't have it anymore because i threw it away years ago but i had like this folder just full of like dreamcast silvers you know yeah like maybe about 40 or so games and it was it was that easy to do like it was it was so simple to do anyone could do it like it, you, you didn't need because when you when you're talking about like modding a system right there's there's a you know there's some technical hurdles yeah. usually or technical there's some hoops that you need to jump through and most of the time it just will like turn the average person away or scare uh-huh. the average person away and say i don't want to do this i don't want to I don't want to open up my system because I may damage my system, right? I don't want to mess with my system, right? But the fact that you could just burn a disc and play it without any any issues, you're right. I think really it it really did um, have a negative, a, a very large negative impact on on the Dreamcast's life cycle. Well, and what it also ended up doing is uh, because every game was so instantaneously accessible for zero dollars. Um, what ended up happening was the cost of actual physical Dreamcast games yeah. tanked instantaneously. Uh, so what a lot of people have asked me the question because I have every single Dreamcast game, uh, and people say you probably spent thousands on that. No, I bought it during the crash. I paid like $1 for almost every single one of my Dreamcast games because they were, pe- people were, were making jokes online where they'd have a picture of like a bunch of blank discs. They'd buy one of those like 75 CDs, burnable. People would be like, oh, here's my Dreamcast collection. The yeah. actual physical boxes, nobody gave a crap. So all my games I paid like $1 for because it was just, even the rare, a lot of the rare ones now, like Skies of Arcadia is worth hundreds of bucks. I mean, at the time, people were just like, eh, I'll burn it. Eh. Yeah. Yeah, I was the same. Like, I, don't, I, don't, I, I certainly don't have a full Dreamcast collection, but I've probably got about 60 games. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've got a sizable chunk of the games. Dude, most of them I bought back in the day for next to nothing. Like, yeah. I've got, like, you know, Cannon Spike and Skies of Arcadia, um, Shenmue 1 and 2. Um, some of the more expensive games, the Resident Evil games as well. I've got like Street Fighter Third Strike and 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 those games that kind of command high dollars these days. Mm-hmm. Back then, they were they were literally putting them in bargain bins yep. and they couldn't they couldn't give them away because uh, no one wanted them. You're absolutely right. Um, so I, I picked them all up because you know I love the system and I think the you know the most of the games like I said were were incredible. So I wanted to I wanted to support it. You know, it, and it's such a shame. It's one of those things of, if I feel like the Dreamcast might be one of the best consoles ever made. It just managed to do some things right, but it made these couple extremely fatal flaws that they just could not recover from. And yeah. and I feel like that had to be the biggest nail in the coffin. Because, I, I mean, if they managed to block that piracy or something, that would have done yeah. something. Because something I always thought was interesting as well, something the, the Dreamcast did first is, uh, Dreamcast is one of the first consoles I ever saw that started to do uh, retro collections. They had the Sonic mm. Classic collections yep. or the the Genesis collections and stuff on like that. They were they were the first yeah. people I saw that had the idea of like, oh the, yeah, the Sega pe- Smash Pack. Yeah, the Sega Smash Pack. Those were yeah. so cool, and that that felt like the first time that a company realized, oh, people want our old catalog. Let's put forty bucks, put it on a disc, sell it to them. Yep. You know? Yeah, and that that goes back to one of those innovations that that they did um, before everyone else. I mean, look, that concept of of old games on on a on a newer system i mean technically you know something like super mario all stars yeah. on the super yep. nes would 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 be kind of the first one that i can think of but you're right i mean before like you know the midway arcade collections and all the stuff that that came out on the og xbox um sega did it first with the smash pack stuff and that was incredible because you know you had that homebrew community like you were talking about before that were running emulators, you know, Super NES emulators and Genesis emulators, and you could mm-hmm. play games via those means. But Sega themselves, you know, um, see the the value in bringing back their collection or a collection of some of their Genesis games to a newer audience. And I think that was a really, really interesting release that they did. Um, from what I recall, the Sega Smash Pack wasn't didn't emulate the games very well. Like the sound was a little mm-hmm. weird. Um, the games ran pretty well, but it was um, it was kind of a, a, a risky gamble for them. It was you know, and that's what that's one thing about the Dreamcast that I think was so cool in that they weren't afraid to take risks. You know, uh-huh. like not everything not everything kind of landed, not everything worked out for them, but it seemed like they they just took these gambles on, on a lot of these things. And like I said, man, like 
the the networking stuff, the the um, the online stuff, the Sega Smash Pack stuff, um, the stuff. I mean, all these things we just take for granted these days. You know, like on the Switch, you know, there's retro collections, there's DLC. Uh-huh. I mean, it's something that we don't even think about as as a big deal, but they came they came first with a lot of these things and. We really have to acknowledge that that they were, uh, you know, the innovators in in a lot of ways for this stuff. You know, sometimes I'll uh, I'll think about those those big those moments of video games that existed and are over. I'll think about man, I wish I could go back in time when there was those uh, copies of Panzer Dragoon suck on the shelves. And I wish I could <laughs> grab five of them or something. You know, right. but one of the things I think about the most is I really wish I could have seen the peak of Dreamcast Online. I do wish mm. I could somehow go back in time and. Yeah honestly record gameplay from that because i did go online with fantasy star online and you would see the crowded cities the christmas events the people would have that big old fluffy chair in town that the the good players would have there is there are certain experiences that were just little slices of time and i feel like that's that's also something the dreamcast unfortunately invented was the temporariness of online societies because that game uh, a lot of those games Whoop, went way up and then way down even there was yeah. even an online community for sega uh, sonic adventure sonic adventure yep. had those races and that went up mm-hmm. and died yeah yeah i played um a lot of quake 3 and unreal oh, tournament yeah. um and there was uh a really cool community at the time i mean there was probably only a few hundred players that would play the game but man it was so much fun to play like quake 3 on on the dreamcast and one really interesting fun fact is you can plug in a Dreamcast keyboard and a Dreamcast mouse uh-huh. and you can destroy your opponents because they're sitting there with the controller, yep. you know, trying to trying to line up a shot. You got the mouse and keyboard and you're just like taking people out. Uh it was it was it was a lot of fun, man. They, they had a weird name for it. If you went into the menu, they called it something weird like Panther or something. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I always loved that. I was like, why is it why that sounds way too hardcore for being the keyboard and mouse guy? <laughs> Um, another thing that was really weird, one of those like hidden features people didn't know about is uh, in the Sega fishing pole, you could mm. cast it. So while you're playing Sega Bass Fishing, it had a realistic simulator to it. Uh, if for some reason you plug that in while you're playing Virtua Tennis by swinging the fishing pole, you could play tennis with motion controls. I didn't know that. That's <laughs> like, incredible. Yeah, there's there's videos. <laughs> so and, like, cool. It's one of those weird things. They're like, why does this exist? And then, of course, oh, Samba de Amigo, where you have to shake oh, the yeah. maracas. It, it's definitely, yeah. I think that's the first console i ever played or or saw that had motion controls that actually semi worked yeah yeah and um typing of the dead with the keyboard Mm -hmm. um man what a a great game i mean just the innovation was was just off off the charts you know like who would have thought that you know you could somehow make a house of the dead game by literally typing letters on a Mm -hmm. keyboard typing words on a keyboard like i that's something that i could never in my wildest dreams you know with with you know the the massive amount of drugs that i would consume <laughs> yeah. ever think about ever think about making a game you know in, in that way and um just like i said just the risks that they took were were some of the the, the highlights for me of that system i love typing of the dead so much uh how it's they, so good they dude. redid it's the so cutscenes. so instead of having guns they have a huge dreamcast with a gigantic double a battery strapped to their back <laughs> and a keyboard floating in front of them like we have to save them it's like what? Is... <laughs> yeah, I love that game so much. And as the thing is, is the Dreamcast. It was the end of that time period of just throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. You know, yeah. as I feel like after that, we started to have more market research. Microsoft was doing a lot of very like like wise choices, very carefully with the Xbox and stuff. Dreamcast was the last console where they're like. You know, make it make a dancing monkey game. Just make a yeah. dancing monkey game. Let, let's make a, a shooter of uh, like Cannon Spike. Cannon Spike. Let's just get a bunch of different characters and also yep. uh, Mega Man and a bodybuilder and Little Red <laughs> Riding Hood and just right. throw them in, yeah. I what about it. um? What do you think about you know? Every so often, um, we'll get uh, a news clipping that'll say, um, the Dreamcast Two is coming back or the Dreamcast is coming back. Yeah when you see those things how does it make you feel knowing you know knowing the history of the system uh it it annoys me just because i don't like fake gaming news in general but also i I don't know like the dreamcast community 
is still so alive and well. Dreamcast Junkyard is still archiving stuff. There's still yep. things we're discovering. There's that uh, unreleased game. It's complete. It was called uh, Propeller Arena. There was like a plain combat game that they were going to yeah. release, and then 9-11 happened, and they went, eh, maybe just cancel this. Like, there's so much to the Dreamcast that's interesting, and it got canned, and that's sad, but I feel like dreaming of a console that's never going to exist is yeah. not really productive. And additionally, I feel like I do think a lot of more casual Sega fans don't realize that Sega is now bigger, more profitable. They're making more games. Like, Sega is actually yep. in a better space now than they were with the Dreamcast. Like, if you want to see what Dreamcast 2 is up to, go play Persona. You know, it's like, I, yeah. I feel like sometimes people people are, uh, nostalgia can sometimes be toxic, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I would like to see maybe the Dreamcast Mini, um, yeah. you know, in the same vein as like the NES Classic and stuff. And there's been some rumblings about that. Um, I would like to see maybe Sega invest some dollars and and come come out with a, a Dreamcast Mini. I think... I think that could sell well, you know, for them and and really bring their games, which, as we mentioned, all of them have aged incredibly well to a new generation. Um, they w- they wouldn't really need much in terms of work to, to you know to play these days. And um, I'd like to see a Dreamcast menu. I think I think that's that's something that Sega could really tap into and and, and give to a new audience. It seems like an easy product. Like pe- people can't see it because I have my camera tilted down, but I have, I have collect every single micro console because I love them so much. I mean, e- even yep. the idea of them is so interesting. Absolutely. If they came out with that, especially because since Sega currently has a bunch of very good infrastructure, um, it'd be cool if the Dreamcast Mini was a little box and you could plug an Ethernet into it and had a little shop on it. You could like play and install yeah. more because that's kind of one of the things that screwed the Dreamcast originally is that it didn't have that hard drive, as you said. It'd be nice if you could just install more games or whatever because I'd buy yeah. them all. I'd have a full set. Yeah, I, I would, I'd be all over that if it came out. I'd, I'd be willing to spend like 150 bucks oh, as yeah. well if they, if they, if they release the Dreamcast Mini. Um, you know, pick, pick 15, 20 of the best games on there. Um, put some of the heavy hitters on there, but also put, you know, um, some of the RPGs and some of the Capcom classics on there, like Power Stone and mm-hmm. and and I know I'm, you know, I'm fanboying a little bit because a lot of these games are probably um uh, cannot be re-licensed or uh-huh. there's there's probably issues getting some of these games back but um in a in a in an ideal world it would be it'd be great if they could just look at the entire collection of their games and say okay let's pick the best 15 and and put them on a collection or put them on a mini system i'd be i'd be definitely all, all over that for sure yeah. If it if it had Marvel Marvel versus Capcom two and nothing else, I still feel like they'd make a profit. Like everybody's yeah. like, "Up, oh, it's my MVC machine." Dude, they, they would have to put MVC two on there. Like oh, yeah. that, that. If if they came out with a mini system that had MVC two on it, you're right. That would be the only game that they would need to put on there, and that thing would sell a lot of units, man. Yeah. Uh, all right. It. I, I see we got like uh, eight minutes left. You want to share favorite Dreamcast memories, favorite Dreamcast game, favorite Dreamcast memory? Um, I think for me, my favorite Dreamcast game would probably be Skies of Arcadia. I think that was, and you know, you probably have a similar story, but for me, um, I, I played Final Fantasy VII on the PS1. I loved the game. I thought, mm-hmm. I mean, it's incredible. I still think it is, but... For me, Skies of Arcadia represented just the next level of, of role-playing games that I'd never experienced before. I didn't know that you could make um, an awesome RPG with 3D mechanics because I always felt like RPGs were was was purely a 2D thing, you know, yeah. 2D sprites and all that stuff, right? Um, so the way that they just nailed the way that that game looked aesthetically plus the incredible story, I think it's probably my, my, my biggest highlight and my best game of the Dreamcast no doubt dude yeah i i I, i'm gonna pick a different one just for variety but yeah the the skies of arcadia in general also the length of skies of arcadia like that game just felt like it went on and on and on i remember going down to the surface and all the fighting gods and stuff and and the fact that it always blew me away that there's two separate incredibly in-depth fighting systems there's two combat systems in there with the the ground fights and the airship fights you have different gear and equipment and recruiting people like it was insane how deep that game was, but I think my favorite Dreamcast memory was the first time I ever saw a Dreamcast. Uh, the day it came out, 
Uh, I wouldn't get it for months later than this, but a kid up the street, everybody always be like, oh, that's Bradley. He gets all the games because his parents are divorced. And I was like, oh, mm. that's so cool. So Bradley got a Dreamcast day one. I go over to his house and he played the the opening level of uh, Sonic Adventure. And uh, God, it just, it, it melted my brain to hear like uh, audio that high quality because I feel like yeah. even the audio jump was so freaking significant. Obviously, the graphics are really cool looking, it, but also the speed. I'd never seen just the ability to just... It, it felt so instantaneous, which I know now we realize is uh, one of the features of the Dreamcast was that SRAM. It could just load mm-hmm. things so quickly, and it, it was so freaking good. I think favorite game, though... Oh, I'm trying not to say Scars of Arcadia because that's such a good one. I'll say I'll say <laughs> Shinmu because I have played Shinmu again and again. Um, and I also feel like Shinmu is, in my opinion, it's the first truly open world game as we'd consider it now. The fact that there is like jobs and forklift driving and all these activities that have nothing to do with the plot and, and arguably mm-hmm. detract from the plot in a way of like, yeah. sitting in the arcade will eventually kill you, but you can just do it all day in that. <laughs> so freaking good. Uh, I, yeah, I love Shinmu. De- definitely some some great memories from that game. And um, yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely rank that very high up there with, the best memories that I had of the Dreamcast. I've been looking at chat. Is anybody typing a chat? Are there any questions or anything? Um, let's see here. If anyone's got any, we've got like five minutes to go chat. So if you've got any questions, ask now, uh, I'm looking at some comments. Uh, Bernie Stoller was largely responsible mm-hmm. for the Dreamcast, not having a DVD player. He was just the worst thing to happen to Sega this side of the Atlantic. True. Uh, Oliver Surplus said, Got Canon Spike for 99 cents at EV Games in 2002. <laughs> well, you're sitting on some money there, my friend. Right, that's that's buying GameStop stock while it's cheap. <laughs> yeah, uh, one just one more said I got Mark of the Wolves on eBay long ago for about 10 bucks. Great pickup. Oh yeah. And dude, those those Neo Geo conversions were incredible as well. Like mm-hmm. The Last Blade and and Mark of the Wolves and King of the Fighters. Uh, Oliver again said Marvel vs Capcom 2. Well, still thirty dollars then, and probably because it was better than the PS2 release. Absolutely, I think mm-hmm. I think NBC2 on the Dreamcast is you know is the best version of that game, no doubt about it. I I remember uh, my friends were big in the Marvel vs. Capcom fighting game tournament scene, and uh, everybody made these customized fight sticks, and they all had to have uh, Dreamcast dongles because yeah. it was the best version. It was the only one that had zero is the zero lag one. Yep. So they're like, all right, if if you want to play and do infinite combos, you have to play this one specific version on the dreamcast yeah if you um i know evo is not really a thing right now because of, of, of um uh, covid19 but if you go to the evo um you watch like the evo championships there's always going to be like a side tournament of mvc2 with mm-hmm. some of the old you know the, the old killers that 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 competed playing uh mvc2 and every, every, they play on dreamcasts mm-hmm. on crts right so it's all old school because that's the only way to play it and you're right. They've got a. They've got like modern joysticks with mm-hmm. adapters connected up to the Dreamcast. It's yeah, it's so incredible that they still do that. It looks so funny to see this little teeny tiny Dreamcast, and they plug it <laughs> in, and they got this huge arcade stick, and they like plop it on their legs and beat the hell out of it. It's like this is it. This is the future I want. Uh, Shane Chowdhury asks, "Do you think the lack of EA games was a major factor in Dreamcaster's struggles?" I, I don't mostly because I mean when I think of EA EA in the the late 90s early 2000s I feel like EA sports was one of the highest profiting things and um, I don't play a lot of sports games but I always heard the yep. 2k series I heard all the I heard our sports games on Dreamcast were, were good uh, enough you know? were, were, were great I mean you know virtual tennis the, the 2k games um, NFL NHL um, yeah there was there was some good stuff on there um, did e, like did EA's you know absence hurt the dreamcast i mean it certainly didn't help right um yeah. it would have been nice to have seen some of the games on the system but I, I don't necessarily know if that if that's you know something that would have been a huge uh, impact i, I appreciate um, the uh, the bernie stiller hate in chat it's, uh, it's well <laughs> uh, jeremy jeremy rydell said the recent uh, thomas wave hacks are exciting are there any other arcade platforms that could be ported so what he's talking about is um the uh, thomas wave arcade system is essentially very similar to Dreamcast hardware. So they were able to get these Atomus Wave games running on the Dreamcast, um, games like Metal Slug 6 um, and some mm. other ones. So um, will other arcade platforms be ported? It's probably unlikely, but um, hey, one that's one thing about the Dreamcast for me that does not surprise me. The community has been going, has, has been ongoing literally since the first day 
to today and and, and onwards there, mm-hmm. there is this this you know group of hard diehard arcade nuts that love the dreamcast and they want to see as much stuff on the dreamcast as possible and i think it's really good to see especially i love the homebrew scene uh but oh, that, yeah. that is our time it is 6 30 folks i appreciate everybody tuning in this has been the brutally honest review 2021 of um the dreamcast it's been very good thank you so much for being here mvg modern vintage you are the king of retro games in my opinion <laughs> i honestly i respect your opinion so much couldn't have done this without you really thank you for being here man uh, appreciate it max and uh thanks uh everyone in the chat for hanging out it was a lot of fun